All right, this is just going to be a short introduction video into intraoral radiology. I'll introduce kind of the main concepts, and then we'll go over them again, and then some other concepts, so further detail in our lecture the next time. So these are the two main types of intraoral imaging. You have your periapical, you see here on your left, and your bite wing here on the right. The periapical, you're looking at the entire tooth. You do want to see the entire crown, and you also want to see the entire roots of the teeth. So the entire length of the root so you can see this PDL, make sure it's nice and uniform. Then you also, you especially want to look at the apical region because that's where you're going to see possible periapical radiolucencies. So if you see some dark area there, some radiolucency, that's a good sign that that tooth could be necrotic. And these images, if taken right, you can also see caries that'll start to develop here just underneath the contact area of teeth. And then bite wings, it's really important that you have the right angulation so that you open up these contacts. I'm talking about this area right here where the teeth contact each other because that's primarily what you're looking for in bite wing radiographs is caries, so radiolucencies that start to develop within the enamel of teeth. Anytime you take an x-ray, you do want to look at the entire image, and we're also looking for bone levels, so the alveolar crest of bone here. You're looking at the entire tooth. So here we see an amalgam restoration. This is so white or radiopaque, we know it has to be metal because nothing else is that dense. And there's a little darkness if you see creeping under here that looks uh, like some recurrent caries. And a lot of times you'll take a full mouth series of x-rays and there's varying ways to do it. There's 10 or there's 20. In this case we have 21. We might do it a little bit different in our case where we only take three of the mandibular incisor radiographs. But this is how it's lined up. So you have periapicals along the top, you have the molars here, the premolars, then you have the incisors or the anterior dentition of the maxilla up here. You have the bite wings right here. And then down below, of course, you have your mandibular teeth, the molars and the premolars and the incisors in the middle. So that's your full mouth series mounted correctly. So for quality control, you want to make sure that the radiograph contains the entire area of interest. So as I said for periapicals, that it's going to contain both the entire crown and the entire root. But also because you want to evaluate the bone around those roots, you need to see at least two millimeters beyond the apex. For bite wings, as I said, it's important to open up the contacts between two different teeth. So you have to get the angulation correct to where these teeth, maybe they just come to a point or it looks like there's a little dark line in between them. And that way you can really see caries. If you have overlap, like in this case, it's going to be a lot harder to diagnose caries because this enamel overlaps and it makes a really white or opaque line there. You also want to look at the overall image brightness, the darkness. Differentiate between enamel and dentin. As you see, this little bit lighter line is the enamel around the tooth. We know it has more mineral, it blocks out more of the x-rays, it attenuates more, that makes it appear lighter in your radiograph. So if you don't see that distinguishing line between the enamel and the dentin, you know there's something wrong with your contrast or your brightness, you might need to adjust KVP or MAS, we talked about in class last time, usually all that we are going to be able to change is the second, so that's how we increase our MAS. Your, your milliamperage and your time we lump together because it has the same effect. But in this case, we're just gonna probably do a longer exposure time if it is too light. If it's too dark, you need to shorten the time. Okay, you probably know at least the basics about teeth. As I said, enamel is more mineralized than dentin, which is why it shows up as more white. But then this material here that is completely white, I would call that completely radiopaque, that has to be a, a, some type of metal. And in this case, we know it's likely an amalgam restoration. So again, here's the enamel, 90, sometimes I, you hear 95% mineralized. Dentin is more similar to bone, where it's about 75% mineralized. And cementum, we know, follows the outline of the roots of the teeth, but you're not going to see it in x-rays. It's too thin. And what's inside here that's even darker, that's the pulp, the soft tissue, which contains the nerves and blood vessels inside the tooth. This is pointing out the root canal. Sometimes you can see that it does come right to the extent of the outline of the tooth. 
but sometimes it may appear that it's too short. That, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem. Sometimes it exits either to the buccal or lingual or maybe the mesial or distal, and that's a, just a normal anatomical variation. Or sometimes it just gets so thin, or it may split into two canals, to where once it splits into two canals, each canal is a lot thinner than it was more occlusally, and it may be too thin to see as you're trying to look at the canal through this thickness of dentin of the tooth. And so just because you don't see it radiographically doesn't mean it's not there. I mentioned periodontal ligament space before. This is ideal here where you see a nice thin uniform radiolucent line around the teeth. And then this white line outside it is what we call the lamina dura. That's just kind of a thin plate of bone that surrounds the tooth that surrounds the periodontal ligament. You see in some cases that lamina dura is thicker or wider than others, whiter, more radio-opaque. In some cases you don't see that lamina dura much at all. And in some cases it may be tough to follow the outline of the periodontal ligament. That doesn't always mean that there's some type of pathology. But when you do see that periodontal ligament expanding getting where you know it's definitely darker than it should be or more radiolucent, that's a good sign that it could be a source of infection or some other type of lesion. In this case, I kind of lose the apical PDL here where I'm pointing, but to me it's not dark enough to really merit a concern. That's just kind of within the normal range of variation. So you need to look at a lot of x-rays and get used to what's normal variation, what to expect, and you'll kind of get used to when to expect that something's more than just variation and it might be pathology or infection. All right, here we point out again the lamina dura, as in this case you don't see a lamina dura at all. In this case you see that it's more opaque than in other areas. It may be thicker than it is in other areas. And that can just be a sign of heavy occlusion. Maybe the tooth is angulated and it's pushed in that direction and bone tends to build up in response to force, and so you may have a thicker lamina dura. So it may not necessarily mean any that significant. And what are we looking at here? It looks like the shape of the roots of a tooth, but you don't see the tooth there. This was a recent extraction. You still have the lamina dura, that dense bone. It's almost like cortical bone that follows the roots of the teeth, and that's going to take quite some time, several months, if not years, to completely remodel that bone. And so that's just a normal extraction socket. Here's a sliced image of a bone where we see sometimes it's more thick than others, but this dense cortical bone on the outside. Of course, that being just compact bone, we'll call it, is very dense and it's going to appear more radiopaque in our radiographs. And then internally we have the marrow spaces and the trabeculation sometimes kind of a honeycomb pattern or, or different variations in the type of pattern that you'll see. In the mandible, more common to see fine articulation with small marrow spaces. And in the mandible, a lot of times, especially in the body of the mandible, and even more so in the ear body of the mandible, you'll see more thick, sparse trabeculations. In a bite wing, you want to look for caries, as we see something there, that little dark spot. But you also want to look at the bone levels. So we're looking at the alveolar crest of bone. In health, it should be within, I'll say, two millimeters of the CEJ, considered normal. But if you have up to three millimeters distance between the, the cemento-enamel junction, which is here, you know, the end of the enamel in the crown of the tooth, to the crest of the alveolar ridge, you're going to expect that usually periodontal disease. And this should also be continuous and form a nice sharp angle with the lamina dura, the lamina dura going around the roots of the teeth here as we see down here. Nice and sharp angles of that lamina dura as then it blends into the alveolar crest. Because when you get periodontal disease, you start to lose bone right at that corner of the lamina dura and the alveolar crest. It starts to kind of curve and you, you lose the definition of that crest of ridge. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the maxillary sinuses because almost always see those in radiographs, especially when you're taking periapicals of any posterior teeth because there's such an intimate relationship between the maxillary sinus border and the posterior maxillary dentition. So if you don't know what a maxillary sinus is, what a sinus is in general, they're air, fluid ca air filled cavities lined by a thin mucous membrane. In perfect health, mucous membrane, that soft tissue membrane of the sinus is gonna be so thin that you don't see it at all. But a lot of people have a little bit 
thickened sinus mucosa, which isn't typically a problem, but it can point to signs of infection or other type of diseases. So you should always look for the borders of a maxillary sinus, and they should be thin and continuous. So similar to what I was showing you about the lamina dura, you should have a thin, continuous cortical line. Here are examples of that, the maxillary sinus. These arrows are pointing to this kind of wavy line as it, it will tend to do. It'll undulate between the roots of the teeth. And if you can think of the roots of the teeth three-dimensionally, what tooth are we looking at here? This is a first maxillary molar, tooth number three. We have a mesiobuccal and a distobuccal root. So those are more buccal on the buccal side of the sinus. And then we have a long palatal root. And depending on your angulation of your x-ray, it can look longer or shorter. But that then lies to the palatal side of the maxillary sinus. It looks like within the sinus as you look at the border of the sinus. But it's lying in a, a thin portion of bone on that side of the maxillary sinus because you can still see at least the PDL space around this palatal root. So this is healthy. This is normal. Sometimes it scoops down even further where it looks like it dips right down between the buccal and the palatal roots of that molar. So very common. Sometimes people have smaller sinuses that don't really even approach the roots. So a lot of different variations that you're going to see and going to have to get used to, but this is a key point that I'll make in evaluating periapical radiographs uh, as well as panoramic radiographs, always follow the border of this sinus. Make sure it's continuous and intact, as we see here. Here on the right side, what tooth is this? We're looking at a canine periapical. Uh, nice radiograph. We see the entire crown. We see at least two millimeters past the apex. So we see the tooth that we want to see. So what do you think these front lines are? There's one that's straight that's running back kind of extends anteriorly. Then there's one that's curved and extends posteriorly. That's what we were just talking about in the maxillary sinus, but this is a different structure. This is the floor of the nasal cavity. And right around the canine, sometimes a little bit further posterior, around the canine or the premolar region, you'll see these lines cross. The nasal cavity, if you kind of know your anatomy, lies more medially to the sinus, but in a two-dimensional x-ray, we can't really judge depth. And so we just see these lines cross and they form an X. I think they call that the line of Ennis. Sometimes they line up perfectly where it forms a Y. But know that the posterior curved line is going to be your maxillary sinus. This flat straight line is going to be the floor of the nasal cavity. That's something important to recognize. All right, I wanted to introduce what is my favorite structure. And what does that mean that it's my favorite structure? It means that you're likely to see it on exams. And there's a reason that it's my favorite. Uh, that's that it is very important, and once you're able to identify this, it makes it easier to identify other structures. So you should always be able to identify here, I'll outline the border of the maxillary sinus. So this is the border of the maxillary sinus, dipping down here. So where it is, where is it back here? We have this kind of accumulation of different radiopaque objects. A thin radiopaque line like what we've seen here, and this is actually the border of the maxillary sinus. And so what is this line extending back here? What is this line coming right here? What these arrows are pointing to? So first of all, up here, this is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. It forms a kind of U-shaped or a J-shaped structure. And it will typically be the first one that you see within the sinus as you're looking more posteriorly. This second line down here, that's going to be, uh, as I already pointed out, the inferior border of the maxillary sinus. And then this one down here is going to be the zygoma itself, which is this is the zygomatic bone or the zygoma. And I'm going to show you all these items on a plastic skull, so hopefully it makes a little bit more sense to you. This skull happens to have the different bones painted different colors. You should recognize the yellow as the maxillary bone, the maxilla. And then this one right here that attaches posterior to the maxilla it forms the cheekbone. That's the zygoma. And so when you're looking at a radiograph, which is taken from about this angle that you're viewing right here, maybe a little bit from the top down, maybe a little from the side, what you're seeing here form that dense curved line is this little saddle-shaped curvature of bone. As you see, what I'm pointing at here is still within the maxilla itself. So this is a process of the maxilla, a process which then forms the suture with the zygoma.
And so that's the zygomatic process of the maxilla. So that's what's forming the little J-shaped or U-shaped saddle-like projection that you see in our intraoral. You also see that when we get to our panoramic anatomy. And so here we see the suture line between the maxilla and the zygoma. And the zygoma forms part of the rim of the orbit, the lateral and inferior borders. Posterior to here, we start to see the zygomatic arch. As you can see, about two-thirds of the zygomatic arch is actually, which bone is this? Temporal bone. So the zygomatico-temporal suture, but most of that zygomatic arch is the temporal bone. You're not going to see that in intraoral images. Furthest back you'll see is you will see part of the zygoma. As you see that start to project back from the zygomatic process of the maxilla. So everything should line up. Things should make sense if you think anatomically. Mental foramen is another important one. The important thing about this is if it happens to line up right at the apex of a tooth, it can look like a periapical rarefaction or a periapical radiolucency. And you can confuse that with the sign that the tooth is necrotic. But what it is is a foramen of the canal as it exits buccal here around the level of the second mandibular premolar. So the mandibular canal is important to know. As we know, it's a fairly thick nerve that runs through the mandible, through the mandibular body. Here it is extending from the posterior forward. Usually it's going to look radiolucent. That's what you expect from a canal, right? It's just filled with soft tissue. So there's a lack of bone in that area. But sometimes if it's surrounded by a dense enough cortex of bone, it can start to appear more opaque internal to the canal than it does outside of the canal. And so what these arrows are pointing out is the superior border and the inferior border of the mandibular canal or the canal of the inferior alveolar nerve. So this is just pointing out here it looks more radiolucent, which is probably more typical. As it crosses the apical region of this tooth, it can form a radiolucent appearance to the apex of that tooth. That doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with this tooth or that that is necessarily a periapical lesion, but it does mean it's in pretty close proximity to that tooth. And I would suspect that the cortex between the canal and the tooth may be non-existent. So if you are thinking of extracting a tooth like that, uh, have second thoughts, make sure you know what you're doing, you're experienced, might be an indication to refer to an oral surgeon, because that's going to be a more difficult extraction, a higher risk at least of damage to that nerve.